Armenians, even those who do not have a good command of the Armenian language, such as me, uh, like to boast of the richness of Armenian literature, a literature of which most have no direct knowledge. Armenians feel slighted when the great cultures of the world are mentioned and ours is not included. But what have we done to make that culture specifically here its literature? Uh, for it is through literature that many people first come to experience a culture available to the world. Very little. Uh, the book we are launching tonight, Bosporus Nights, The Complete Lyric Poems of Bedros Turia, uh, may or may not turn out to be in the vanguard of a, a wave of publications that begins to rectify the situation. But even if it turns out to be an isolated occurrence, it is, in my opinion, a very important volume because it presents to the English language reader for the first time all of the poems written in the brief life of Bedros Turian, generally regarded as the inventor of the modern Armenian poetic language. And if that were not enough, the poems are accompanied by the translator's learned, insightful, and witty commentary. A generation or two ago, Professor Russell's predecessor at Harvard, Robert Thompson, along with such other scholars as Nina Garsonian and Krikar Maksudian and others, made available in English the bulk of medieval Armenian historical writings. Is it too much to ask that the same be done for the best in Armenian's literature? I'm a literature major, and that's, you know, my particular bias. I'm proud that Bosporus Nights had its genesis in an article that originally appeared several years ago in Nasser's Journal of Armenian Studies, Bedros Turian's cruciform poem and its antecedents. I'm proud that Nasser's Armenian Heritage Press was able to collaborate on this volume with Harvard's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. I'm proud to have worked with Professor Russell in bringing the book to completion, and I am proud to be able to stand before you tonight to introduce him. Our speaker tonight, Professor James Russell, is the Mesra Mashtos Professor of Armenian Studies at Harvard University, a position he has occupied since 1992. Three. In addition to Bosporus Nights, the book we are here to launch tonight, his books are Armenian and Iranian Studies, a massive compendium of his scholarly articles, The Book of Flowers, an Armenian epic, The Heroes of Kasht, Zoroastrianism in Armenia, and Hovanas Tukharansi and the Medieval Armenian Lyric Tradition. Three of these titles, Armenian and Iranian Studies, The Book of Flowers, and Zoroastrianism in Armenia, were published or co-published by Nasser, I'm happy to say. And it goes without saying, I hope that all are available in the Nasser bookstore. So please join me in welcoming back to Nasser, Professor James Russell. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me here. for coming on a weekday evening. On the occasion of the publication of this book, Bosphorus Nights, I wish, first of all, to thank Manut Young, the founder of Nasser, the founder of the Scholar of the Chairs in Armenian Studies in this country, uh, really the pillar of our subject in every practical way. Um, and who should be himself the subject, I think, of a biography, if he'll permit us access to the archives. Um, I also would like to thank Mark Mamigonya, not only, and not even mainly, for shepherding the volume from amorphous manuscript to firm incarnation, but for his and Michelle's constant friendship for Bob Dylan, UCAS, Aleo, and Indian Takeout, for the inestimable company of Miles and Luna, for hushed and snowbound Belmont streets after long evenings of wonderful conversation, and for a decency that is the moral equivalent of perfect pitch, and most of all, for future readings of Joyce. Uh, Mark said he was a literary man, and I intend to take the fullest advantage of his particular <laughs> Uh, area of expertise. I've dedicated this book to an old friend, Lucien Barsamian. In a world of copies and of fakes, Lucic, you were an original. Where are you? Uh, an original. 
and sterling too. Vosky Vosky Vijansivi. The book is a translation, the first into English, of the complete poetic works of the Western Armenian Romantic poet Bedros Turian. Uh, it contains the Armenian texts, the commentary accompanying each poem, and an introduction with an appendix consisting of a critical essay on the poet by another great Armenian poet, Parur Sabak, who died in 1971, exactly a hundred years after Bedros Turian. And of texts and reminiscences relating to Turian's life and work. Though Alice Blackwell, at the turn of the 20th century, Minas Cheraz, a decade later, and Valery Gusev during the First World War, rendered a substantial portion, pro, proportion of the poems into English, French, and Russian, respectively, and there were also good Italian translations. He has received little critical attention in the West in nearly a century, and uh, his entire, the entirety of his works has never appeared anywhere in, foreign, in a foreign language. The documentary and editorial labors of Turian's work of Arshak Chobanyan, above all, uh, of Sharurian and Sevag in Soviet Armenia, and of others writing in Armenian about the poet have prepared the groundwork for an exploration of Turian's work in depth. Uh, and I've re relied on their groundwork in my edition. I, I think I owe most of the material in there actually to Parur Sevak and to Sharurian, the great expert in um, Western Armenian literature of the 19th century generally. My next uh, project is a work on Misak Metarens, uh, about whom Shavarian is again the principal scholar. And he's still alive, uh, living in Yerevan. I hope future students of Armenian literature and scholars investigating the poet's work more deeply, uh, working in English, will benefit from my modest efforts. Turian began an autobiographical novel which he entitled Vosporyan Kishernesh, Bosphorus Nights. His articles and letters show he was as original a writer of prose as of poetry. I don't even go into his plays in this book. And the novel would have been his only major work in prose. A fair amount of it was written. Those who read it thought it showed great promise, but even the unfinished manuscript has been lost. I've called my book after Bosphorus Nights for several reasons. The loss of this novel in a way foreshadows the larger and more tragic disappearance of the cosmopolitan culture of Turian's city, Constantinople, and the obliteration of Armenian life <coughs> throughout Anatolia in the genocide. The loss of the manuscript of Bruno Schultz's only novel, The Shoal, has come similarly to be seen as emblematic of the destruction of the civilization of the Jews of Eastern Europe in the Holocaust. When we speak of the Armenian Holocaust, very often uh, we don't mention the enormity of the cultural losses. Yes, there were enormous losses of human beings, but also an entire civilization was done to death. And the cosmopolitan culture that allowed an art like Bedros Turian's to flourish vanished. In The Master and Margarita, Mikhail Bulgakov's great novel, his character Volan, an incarnation of Mephistopheles, plucks a novel from oblivion restores it from the ashes, and intones to its author, Rukapisi Nigariat, manuscripts do not burn. In fact, a year before Bulgakov wrote it, uh, Derenik Demirjan wrote the same thing in his book Kirk Zakkans. They lived in similar circumstances. Sometimes, though, manuscripts do burn in the real world, and Heinrich Heine warned that those who start by burning books will end up 
by burning men. The loss of Vosporian Kishernez, in a way, presages a much larger and more terrible loss. By naming the book after Turian's lost novel, one memorializes his lost world, one in which a ticket for the Bosphorus ferry was printed in Armenian, French, Greek, and Turkish. Here it is on the cover. This is an actual Bosphorus ferry ticket uh, from a few years after Turian's life. He would have used one exactly identical to this, and it's reproduced in such a way as to sail dynamically towards the purchaser of his volume. <laughs> this is what's known as marketing. In <laughs> yeah, but it also, in the, but it, it, the, the Bosphorus ferry ticket was also a ticket for Turian himself out of the confined world of his childhood into the modern world of Constantinople, the theater, the company of artists and writers. One endeavors also to render unto Bedros's delicate shade the glory he insisted always was his due and that he never received in his life, albeit in the reflected sky of a different language, on the shores of a new world. And finally and simply, the vista of the waters of the Bosphorus, its new steam-powered ferries, they came into being the year of his birth, and the twinkling lights in its far European shore are the light motif of Turian's short life, its longings and exhilarations and reveries. The steamship in the 19th century was a symbol, a symbol of progress. Honoré de Balzac, in The Girl with the Golden Eyes, declares Paris to be, I quote, a superb vessel laden with intelligence. This craft may pitch and roll, but she plows through the world of men, furrows the sea of science full steam ahead, cries through the voices of her scholars and artists, forward march, follow me. The great 19th century French capital in this novel, a capital frequented by students from the Ottoman Empire, both Armenian and Turkish. It was actually a Turkish student who raised the tricolor during the 1848 uh, uprising um, at, at the Sorbonne. Um, the capital is a steamship here, relentless in its linear progress into a better future. The embodiment of industrial achievement that would bring that future a great machine fueled by gold and dedicated to pleasure. At about the same time, the boy poet in the Ottoman capital, Bedros Turian, compares the celebration of the Sahmanat Rutyun, the constitution recently granted by the Sultan to the Armenian community, to a steamship crossing the Bosphorus, the strait that divides European Constantinople from Asian Scutari, present-day Uskudar, Turian's home. The ship in Turian's treatment is a symbol of hope more than an assertion of power. And I'll read it to you. In the month of the rose and of dawn, May 24th approaches, a heart-arresting date of fiery memory. Behold the snowy cloud lit in this blue ether. See the azure wave of this Bosphorus. Let us leave it, brother. Let heaven and sea gaze upon each other. Behold this copse, luxuriantly verdant. Ver it has shade and susurrus. Let us leave it too, brother. Let people make love there. Behold these steamships adorned with laurel wreaths and banners that fly, cleaving the azure flanks of the Bosphorus. A motley crowd are aboard. Their hearts beat more powerfully than the steamship's wheels. You would think fervor rather than the ship's engine, conveyed them. There are women there, too, beings like the fixed stars, illuminating the planets that circle round them, snapping flags, fiery brows, bewitched glances, snatches of shouts, the trill of musical instruments. Oh, where is this heart-stopping edifice going? There, where the cloudlets also are, wave, cops, shade and whisper, beauty, hue, aroma, everything is there, but love is different there, Many love each other there. There the souls are in love. There they love a fatherland. 
There they celebrate the memorial of a constitution granted by the emperor. A national feast is consummated there. Let us hire ourselves, brother, to that steamship, faster than a lightning bolt striking the Vatican. Uh, Turian was very anti-clerical in some respects, as, at least as, as he regarded the nefarious plans of Rome towards the Armenian church and people. So that's his lightning bolt hitting the Vatican. Uh, it seems once to hasten to that holy region, there where the fragrance of souls is wafted through the air. National festivals are a nation's respiration. But look how short this loving day lasts. The sun hurries to extinguish its rays upon the mountain's peak. The very air untimely perishes even as hearts still throb and lips are still a tremble to speak. The ships sound their whistles, a dire knell of parting. Have you seen the wave that hisses upon the seashore stands, sands to invite celebrants to sail away or return? Have you heard that vast, sorrowful, shuddering bon voyage the trees make, who were present to witness the tendernesses twined beneath their shade? Truly bitter is this hour, but lest the entire year be bitter, would that those inflamed brows not grow cold when that last day's light on the horizon expires. The poet's up. Oh, Sorry. What was that? It was, uh... Oh, an echo. Carry on. Oh, no? I thought the day's light expired and <laughs> came out of the past. The poet's optimism would seem well-founded. In the two decades of Turion's brief meteoric life, he was born in 1851, contracted tuberculosis as a teenager, and died in the first month of 1872, a Bosphorus steam ferry company was founded, and its fleet multiplied geometrically through his, through his lifetime. His prose poem appeared in one of the many Armenian newspapers that had also recently been founded in the capital, whose Armenian population briefly exceeded that of the other main non-Muslim population, that of that perpetual friend and uneasy neighbor, the Greeks. The speed of development in Ottoman Constantinople in the latter half of the 19th century was so explosive that when the French novelist Gustave Flaubert visited the city in 1850, he predicted in a letter that in a century's time, Constantinople would be the capital of the world. This was the time when the vernacular Ashkarapaj of Armenian decisively displaced once and for all classical Armenian Karapaj, and secular literature and science finally superseded theology. One of Turian's earlier poems describes that particular urban experience, the chance encounter with a beautiful stranger. It is said appropriately on that most modern conveyance, the Bosphorus steam ferry. Turian is reading the newspaper, that other emblem of modernity, and the style, especially when one compares it with many other lyrics of his, is taut and direct, and it was written, it seems, on the spot. Earlier students of Turian's work tended not to appreciate this rather unpolished narrative form. But for a reader today, it seems to anticipate modernist and realist styles of poetry, so perhaps we're better prepared to enjoy the effort. This is it. It's called Haydn, the Armenian woman. It was in autumn one evening when I was returning to Skutari. The weather was clear, the breeze gentle, and the waters of the sea were calm. On the foredeck of the ferry, seated in a corner, alone, attentively I was reading the newspapers of the day. Then suddenly the sound of the step of one ascending on the stair disturbed me and I turned my eyes that way. An Armenian woman was the one coming up, tall of stature and lovely of face. She passed by me with haughty gait and sat in my corner, face to face. Oh, you would have thought her a heavenly angel come down. To spread light, perfume the air with love, bewilder burning hearts. I still do not know why I again fixed my eyes on my paper the rest of the time. My heart was so confused. Till then the sailor, coming by with harsh voice, said, we've reached Scutari, why are you still sitting there? I raised my eyes. There was no one on the ferry. We two were all alone, either one 
and the other the sailor. Another vignette concerns another crossing of the Bosphorus on an important occasion in the poet's life. It was in Turian's lifetime that the modern Armenian theater came into being, and he was one of the community's very first playwrights. Uh, his contemporary, Hago Baronian, the humorist, is the other, and a much better playwright. That's one of the reasons I didn't occupy myself with the plays. They're a little bombastic. But anyway, that wasn't what was important about the theater for Turian. It was the exposure he got to the world of art. Uh, to something outside his family's rather narrow confines. His father, after all, was an iron ironsmith and uh, very, very traditional. But in this case, too, the ferry is the vector of the unstoppable trajectory away from tradition and Asia towards Europe, progress, secularism, freedom, and dissipation, a life of pleasure. In short, the literary. In a biographical study of the poet, published at the uh, turn of the 20th century, the scholar Arshak Chobanyan described a class trip from Scutari to Pera. This, is, this was the European enclave of Constantinople, it's a westernized district now called Beolu, uh, that seems to have been one of the most carefree and joyous moments of Turian's short sojourn on Earth. It was, again, a specifically urban experience. And this is Chobanyan's narrative. Serapion Tuchlian. Tuchlian was uh, Turian's literature teacher. Serapion Tuchlian invited Bedros's whole class to the performance of his play Eleonora, which was to take place at Pera. I don't know how his father's extreme severity softened sufficiently on this occasion for him to permit his son to spend a whole night in Pera. But there was the fact of an invitation from a teacher and for many uneducated fathers, the teacher possessed tremendous significance. Serapion Tuchlian, whose practical lesson in literary scholarship I heartily applaud, gave his pupils a box into which they crammed like sardines, one on top of the other. At the end of the play, Turian and his comrades, their mouths agape in wonder at the finery of the theater goers and the stage sets, left the theater with no idea of where to go. They hung around on the street without much money in their pockets or any destination in mind. It happened to be winter, too, so even the most stout-hearted could not withstand the bitterly cold weather. The whole group went into a cheap cafe to while the night away over a 20 para cup of coffee. Laughing and joking, with Turian the master of the rebels, they saw in the sunrise, at last. But now they were ravenously hungry, and the money left? was barely enough for their ferry tickets back to Scutari. Heads drooping in the rainy gray dawn, they paced the sidewalks before the slumbering great houses. What was to be done? Suddenly, one of them espied the newly opened shop of an Ishkembeji in the street of the Holy Trinity Church. Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't know what Ishkembe Chorbas is? Okay. This is tripe soup. Uh, it's actually very good. And in Turkey to this day, if you spend the night drinking, it's a good way to get over a hangover. So at about 5, 6 in the morning, you can go to an Ishkembeji, and there will be a bunch of guys sitting there eating this stuff. I did That was what I did my first day in Ankara with Armin Arroyo. Um, so the people who plied that trade, our Chobanya continues, had the custom of serving up their juicy fare for free on the opening day of a shop. Without waiting for an elaborate invitation, the kids all piled into the restaurant with much laughter and clamor in a frontal assault on the Ishkembejis and concluded their extraordinary night with a gluttonous repast. Now, this is the sort of moment of which literary <coughs> lives are made. If Turian could have lived longer, met Edna St. Vincent Millay and read her poem about a trip on the Staten Island Ferry, Recuerdo, they would have understood each other without a further word. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry, and the sky went wan, and the wind came cold, 
and the sun rose dripping, a bucket full of gold. She wrote about her crossing New York Harbor. On other Bosphorus nights, Turian and his friends would look out over the waters towards the lights of Constantinople from Chamalija, a hill in Scutari. He frequented a cafe that is still in business there and still Armenian owned. He loved to tarry and dream in the cypress groves of Bavlakbasha, the Skutari cemetery where his mortal remains were actually to find their resting place. Most of Turian's poems were written in the last two or three years of his life when he was already ill with tuberculosis. The Bosphorus is still in these poems. It's still beautiful, but Turian's craft becomes dark. He works with the tarry substance of death foreseen, impending, arriving. For it seems he never enjoyed the reciprocal love of a woman. He knew there were many experiences in life he would never live to see. His friends were companions from school. And the closest of these, Vartan Lutfian, was also carried off by tuberculosis only a few months before the disease claimed Turian himself. The poet wrote this poem. At the grave of the most beloved Vartan Lutfian, lament, O streaming rays of heaven that joined our hearts to one another, our hearts dedicated to love, how much they were for one another, boundless open books, where every word had a nether depth of love and pain, Oh, do you recall how we sat silently smoldering on the hill of Chamlija, the cypresses affording us their black and grieving shade? We looked upon the undulating blue of Stambul's girdle Bosphorus, from there to the cloudless sky, to our silent souls, what delight. Those filaments of sky, those snowbound cumuli, oh, till dusk, one by one, they captivated our gaze. We did not speak. Our soul's talk would have defiled the infinite, like two discolored flames. Within each other we burned instead. Our souls were the cypresses, black butterflies grieving. We sucked the black of inexhaustible morning from this earth ever gazing, far away. Despair, that black milk of the grave, we drank deep. That drink sated you entirely, and you became heaven's sallow child. The pale, your paleness often grieved me, and your final expiring glance upon me, alas, was your memory's nail driven into my side. Are you happy there or sad? Send me tidings on an angel's wing. <coughs> ah, this world is ever weary. This world is a mother of great pain. Oh, if the shade of a tree there may be found, and a rill besides. If imperishable love is there, if there are freedoms there, free airs, Oh, I toss in the filthy raiment of my soul my whole life until today. I clothe myself in earth, the morning soil. Ah, Vartan, are the things we longed for there. This powerful elegy, set in the calm of the cypress cooled airs above the Bosphorus, employs a number of powerful symbols to achieve its sense of emotional anguish. Turian's heart and Vartan's are both infinite books and pale flames. Here the manuscript is that which eternally burns, its message printed in the dismal ink of Phlegathon, the river of Hades. In another poem, Turian wrote that were his heart to be open, one would find there not a great tone, Madian, but a conflagration, Hirstet. When a poet writes this way, even if he denies the first image, the book, he has already evoked it, so he means for you to experience something possible only in literature, both book and fire at once, contraries connected. Not manuscripts that don't burn, but manuscripts that survive as they do, like the burning bush in the Bible. You see? The mutually impossible made coterminous. Vartan's memory is a nail in Turian's side, like the lance that pierced the crucified Savior. In another poem, Turian blasphemously declares his own cry of pain to be a nail hammered into the flanks of God. But the image of black milk, Sevgat, is particularly arresting. 
I've mentioned that in the poem, The Armenian Woman, the poet seems to stand close to the threshold of modernism. But here, Turian has crossed that threshold for a time and has boldly anticipated the most extraordinary image of the most powerful strophe, of the most famous poem, of one of the most important post-World War II poets, the German language poet Paul Celan. <coughs> Celan was a native of Chernovitz, modern Chernovtsi in Ukraine, then in Romania. His family were murdered by the Nazis, and at the end of World War II, he wrote a poem entitled Todesfuge, Death Fugue, a poem about the death camps that has been called the Guernica of post-war European literature. Guernica is Picasso's painting of the bombing of a Basque city by the fascists. The poem begins with the line in which is embedded its most powerful and best known metaphor, one that is surreal and contrary to fact, a metaphor which is in uh, Ceylon's biographers, John Felstiner's characterization, extreme, bittersweet, nullifying the nourishment vital to humankind. Schwarzes Milch der Führer, wir trinken sie abends. Black milk of dawn, we drink it at dusk. Though the image Schwarzes Milch had been used in a book published in 1939 a poet, by a poet whom Ceylon knew, it is not known whether he found this image there or somewhere else or came up with it independently. At any rate, it is most unlikely he could have known Turian's work. Ceylon's poem continues, Wir trinken sie mittags und morgens, wir trinken sie nachts, Wir trinken und trinken, wir schaufeln ein Grab in den Lüften, da liegt man nicht eng. We drink it at noon and in the morning. We drink it at night. We drink and drink. We dig a grave in the air. One does not like cramped there. We drink and drink. The same image of grotesque satiety or even sardonic intoxication that we find in Turian's poem in his use of the verb hapret snell. And the grave, German Grab, Armenian Kerezman, is there too. In other words, this little known Armenian poet anticipated in his own imagination one of the greatest poems of the latter half of the 20th century. And yet this has never been recognized till now. In a letter to a friend, Turian offers these cryptic sentiments. Ah, I implore and beg providence, together with you, that life and death be commanded for a moment to lay down their arms, that I may see, too, the joining of the sarcophagus bird and the son of night, What heart-lifting moments, that joining is a meeting of lightning and flower, sun and cosmos will behold a happy nuptial pair. The image of the nocturnal sun, a sun visible at night, the black sun of melancholy, an image, again, contrary to fact, terrifyingly absurd as nightmare and striking in its tangible darkness in much the same way as black milk, here may express a desire of the poets to plunge into death, experience it, and rise from it on the mystic wings of a phoenix. In another poem, Turian had called himself a black butterfly, grieving amidst the cypresses. And here the bright hues of the butterfly again merge with the black colors of death, and the butterfly assumes its classical role as a symbol of the soul after the decease of the body. It is possible that Turian had read of this black sun he mentions in a famous poem by Gerard de Nerval called El Desticado the disinherited, which T.S. Eliot was to cite in his poem, The Wasteland, at the end of World War I. Nerval, a famous French decadent, had visited Constantinople in 1843, just seven years before Turian's birth, uh, and he describes in his, in his Voyage en Occion a walk through the district of Pera. 
Uh, he died in the mid-1850s when Turian was still a small child, so there is absolutely no doubt that Turian could have read his work. Um, Turian's French was proficient, in fact. If the young Armenian read the work of Nerval, then the latter's esoteric hermeticism and the romantic attitude of melancholy that suffuses his poems merge with Turian's existential horror that of a preternaturally aware and vibrantly passionate young man of genius whose life is insidiously being destroyed by an incurable disease. Though the lights on the shores of the Bosphorus glimmered, night was coming on, night flooded in, and the ferry of Turian's loving glances over the edge of a newspaper, his sparkling evocations of dew in the dawnlight, his mischievous plays on words, his forays with his friends to Pera, his sweet voice chanting the Sharagans, the hymns of the Armenian church, were whelmed in the black waters of a final and early inundation. And by the time Taniel Varujan emulated him with his own poem, Murmurs, Durdunsh, the greater night still of the 1915 genocide was already falling. And by 1950, the date, when Flaubert had predicted Constantinople would be the capital of the world, Istanbul was neither the capital of the world nor even of a truncated Republic of Turkey. And what little was left of its cosmopolitan character was in process of being systematically eradicated. Perhaps one of the only voices left of that cosmopolitanism, indeed, is that of the very brave writer Orhan Pamuk, whose novel about the city many of you have seen and who has had his own troubles with the regime. Bedros Turian's life is frozen in the amber of his adolescence, this youthful feature of romanticism, in his case determined by the tragic, tra tragic brevity of his earthly career, is translatable to a culture that seems to regard more the morning of life than its dusk. But in his time, too, people died mostly in early middle age and at home. The sight and smell of death were normal to them in a way that might be terrifying to us. Much else, too, might seem strange. The rugged optimism of the mid-19th century Ottoman Armenians, who believed so firmly in the power of enlightenment and the certainty of progress. Visitors to Constantinople believed it to be the city of the future. One should not scoff at their misplaced hopes. What illusions about the future do we cherish today, which in a few decades may, may come to be considered impossibly <coughs> quaint? What seems sure and will what seems sure, what will entirely deceive us or our descendants? Turian thought, in his patriotic poems, that the Sultan would protect the Armenians against the depredations of the Kurds, when in fact the Sultan was behind them. He thought that the only dangerous opponent of human freedom in Europe was the Vatican. He wrote of the imprisonment and death of the Russian-Armenian poet and democratic activist Mikhail Nalbandian, who was working for a revolution that he believed was to signal the end of history and inaugurate an unbroken rational paradise of human bliss, which we have not seen. What makes bearable the peril and tragedy of human existence is ultimately the continuity of life itself, the people who carry on and who create and love. Bedros's younger brother, Mihran, went on to become Yehisheh, abbot of the monastery of Armash, those of you who are from uh, Anatolia know this monastery where the Charchapan Surpas Vadzadzin still hangs. There's a copy of it uh, at 187th Street where I grew up, and I'll tell you why in a second. He became abbot of the monastery, archbishop, then patriarch of Jerusalem, a public servant, a scholar of literature, particularly a meticulous scholar of his his older brother's work, and a great Armenologist. In my uh, book, Zoroastrianism in Armenia, I quote extensively his work on the pre-Christian uh, 
religion of the Armenians. And that was long before I knew that Archbishop Yanishet Turian had in fact also been Mihran Turian, who was also the chronicler of Bedros Turian's life. These things come together as you, as you grow. His cousin Revond, Leon, became a clergyman too, crossing the Atlantic to serve the Armenian Church in America as primate of the Eastern Diocese until the knives of assassins felled him on Christmas of 1933 in Upper Manhattan in the Holy Cross Church of Armenia, a few blocks from where 20 years later yours truly was born. And there's the copy of the Armash painting. Most of all, I think it is the work we do that imparts meaning and lessens death sting. And Turian is immortal in a country he never even imagined through this work. So Bosphorus Nights brings to you the creative work and all the poems of Bedros Turian, who will, if I may paraphrase Vladimir Nabokov's obituary of the great poet Khodosievich, remain the pride of Armenian poetry as long as its last memory lives. Nabokov concluded his celebration of Khodosievich this way, and I'll use it to celebrate Turian. Well, so it goes. There is no sense of consolation. If one starts to encourage the sense of loss by one's private recollections of a brief, brittle, human image, that melts like a hailstone on a windowsill. Let us turn to the poems. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a limited number, and uh, 
it won't be officially published until the summertime. Uh, it's being done in conjunction, as I said, with Harvard University, but we, you know, liberated a couple boxes uh, from, from the truck for, for tonight. Um, Sandra has absconded with the with the uh, with the, the tickets, so we'll do that after the discussion. So if you have any questions or, or comments or anything, this would be a good time to ask them. Sure. Any, any yes, sir. The Armenian intellectuals in Constantinople were presumably bilingual. Yes. Did they ever write in Turkish? Yes, indeed. Um, Turian had a classmate whose name I forget, but it's in the introduction, sorry. It's in the introduction here, who actually became the editor of the Turkish newspaper. Um, Constantinople was linguistically somewhat unusual. It had its own Armenian dialect, and it had a stable Armenian population since Byzantine times. However, through the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, Armenians from the eastern, pro eastern and central provinces of Anatolia flooded into the city. Many of them spoke Armenian dialects, uh, which were almost mutually incomprehensible, so that the Western Armenian literary language evolved in part out of a response to this need to have a common language in which to communicate. Many of them also spoke primarily Turkish. Uh, a good example would be from a more recent period is Vahag and Dadrian's family, who were from Chorum. Uh, the family in Chorum spoke Turkish and only Turkish. When they came to uh, Constantinople, uh, they adopted Armenian as a spoken language. So he spoke principally Armenian because he was younger, and his elder brother spoke mostly Turkish because he had come to maturity in Chorum, Chorum east of Ankara. So the same is true for other places in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. As a result, uh, there was a large armeno turkish press and a considerable literature. Um, the center of this literature, however, was not so much Constantinople as Cilicia. And um, a number of newspapers were published in Armino Turkish in the Adana area. Um, the Armenian writers of Constantinople frequently used individual Turkish phrases or words in their works in order to express uh, conversational. Uh, vivid conversational snatches, say. So we know that they were conversant with the language. Uh, Bedros himself changed his name. His family name was Zambayan. Uh, and this was a general trend towards the armonization of surnames in the 19th century. Uh, so he knew Turkish, but he chose intentionally not to use it and didn't write in it. Uh, his father, however, when he was dying, and this is in the appendix, uh, uh, laments in Turkish to his son. So, so the elder Zambayan was largely Turkish speaking, Bedros was not. Uh, one of the ways that, they, that, that Armenian was inculcated in the younger generation was through organizations called the Anterza Sirats Mutunesh the uh, organizations of those dedicated to reading, lovers of the printed page, yes? Um, and he belonged to several of these. Uh, the church was, all, the Armenian church was also a great disseminator of literacy in Armenian. We're also dealing with a period in which uh, there was a strong European presence in the Ottoman Empire, and this encouraged Armenians and other minorities to feel that they had a tie with the larger world of Christendom, so that when they translated books into the language they used, they tried to do it into Armenian, a language associated with Christianity <coughs> rather than Ottoman Turkish, Osmanlıca, which they associated principally with Islam. Um, in fact, Armenian was printed earlier 
than Turkish because of the strictures against printing the Arabic alphabet, which did not apply to the Armenian alphabet in a Muslim state. You get enorm an enormous amount of Armenian translated literature also from Venice. The Mehitarists, many of whom were themselves from the Ottoman Empire and who moved to the relative freedom of Papal Italy, uh, translated not only textbooks, uh, scientific books and other works, but also the literature of the age, so that in Bedros's youth we have um, uh, Kasan Hazar Parasang Nesh uh, Tsovundag, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Yeah? Um, or Nan Tuket Si Arthur Gordon Pimi Bad Mutuna, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket by <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah? So, so Armenian translation was not only burgeoning at this period, but it was also very up to date. These were the very latest things. Uh, in, his, in his preface to the Communist Manifesto, uh, Karl Marx says that although his work has been translated into a variety of European languages, the only Oriental one he knows of is into Armenian. He says there were actually two but he doesn't have access to them because they were confiscated by the Ottoman police. So that together with linguistic reform went also political reform in the translation of books on politics and economics into Armenian. Um, I mentioned Mikhail Nalbandian who wrote in Eastern Armenian. Uh, this was a language which was easily intelligible actually to speakers of Western Armenian and he visited Constantinople on his way to Europe in the 1860s on a trip. Uh, when he returned to Russia, he was arrested by the Tsarist authorities and died in a place called Kamwishin in, in 1863, I think. Um, and Bedros was aware of his, his visit, aware of his work, and wrote several angry poems and one play called Garakir i Sibir, The Exile to Siberia, <laughs> which he dedicated to Mikhail Nalbandian. Another person, I realize I'm going on a bit, but this is just interesting, and you know. Another person who encouraged the use of Armenian rather than Turkish, and who is the subject of several poems by Bedros, um, is Krimyan Hayrik. Uh, and his, well, he gave his famous sermon about the Iron Ladle, the Yergat Yashereb. Are people familiar with what that is? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, several years after, who is not familiar with the Iron Ladle Sermon? Uh, well, everyone else is? Okay, so like Nasreddin Hoja, those who are, tell us more. <laughs> no, no, briefly speaking, after the Russo-Turkish War, the, uh, the Ottoman Christian minorities were supposed to receive certain protections, which they didn't get. They got a lot of stuff on paper. Um, Krimyan Hayri, when he returned, who was the Armenian uh, archbishop who represented the community, when he returned to Constantinople, we'll gave a famous sermon at Kumkapu, in which he said that the European powers had an enormous vat of herisa, keshke. Right. And it's a kind of it's a kind of a broth. Yeah? And the Serbs had a nice sharp bayonet to serve themselves keshke. But all the Armenians had was a petition made of paper, and then the, the, the Europeans said, well, you can't serve yourself with that, the paper will melt. Next time, bring a spoon with you. And then Krimian uh, said, I looked around and where were my heroes of Sassoon of these other places? You see? They, were, they weren't there, of Zaytun. So he says, we have to have an iron spoon. That was a remarkable sermon for its day, you see? And what was also interesting about it, yeah, is that it showed a, a, an in, a curious degree of knowledge by 
Krimian Heinrich, who was after all an archbishop and community leader of the latest achievements in Armenian ethnography, because it was only four years before that um, Bishop Karakin Servanstians, who was an emissary from the Patriarchate of Constantinople to the interior to write about the situation of the Armenians in the Van and Mush regions, discovered the Epic of Sassoon, about which I've written a lot, in which there's an incident in which uh, Sassoon C. David takes a whole enormous gatsa of keshtek that, that has been prepared for a festival when they won't give him any, and he takes it off to the shepherds right. himself, you see? Yeah. So it seems that Krimian Heinrich knew the story, uh, this oral tradition, which means that in addition to the various other kinds of knowledge that were being cultivated in Armenia, there, was, there were also the beginnings of ethnographical work. That became a very important branch of Armenian literary study towards the end of the 19th century uh, in Turkey. So, um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> they did have <laughs> But uh, also Armenians knew French and some Russian and so on. Yeah. Researching for recently, I was told that he wrote mainly in Turkish, which um, most of his books, I guess, were in English, which was rather interesting. Yeah, I haven't done very much with his work, and I've only read the Armenian plays. And, and so, I mean, at a very young age, you know, this person decides to write, you know, makes a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. That's what's biographical. Yeah. Like Armenian. Yeah, Armenian was never ceased to be a spoken language. However, for Armenians today, most of whom, if, if their native language isn't English or Russian or something, have a native language that's Armenian, it's hard to remember that in the 19th century, a great many of the Armenians of the interior of the Ottoman Empire did not know Armenian as their primary tongue. And that many people, even if they did speak some Armenian, tended to write in Armen or Turkish. This came across me very forcefully uh, at an exhibition of postcards at St. James uh, a few years ago. Uh, instead of looking at the pictures, I was looking at the messages on the back, and most of them were written in Armino Turkish rather than Armenian. And these were from areas which are not traditionally the centers where Armenians were forced to speak only Turkish. So that there were most so it was mostly Armino Turkish, for example, from Yerzinka. Yeah? We don't think of Yerzinka as a Turkish-speaking area. So, so yes, I mean, this, this, it was a conscious effort. It was an actual uh, what, cultural policy. And it was a self-motivated cultural policy, which in its way was as focused and as powerful as Mashtots' invention of the alphabet centuries earlier. Uh, yeah, Rachel. This is Rachel Bashkarian, who is in the history department at Harvard, a PhD student. Oh, thanks very much. It was wonderful. I just have one question about his education, because you're yes. mentioning you know, that his, mm -hmm. both of his brothers were priests, so mm -hmm. they were important priests. Um, what kind of an education did he have, and uh, how, how might this have affected his Armenian language? And sort of in addition to that question is, mm -hmm. would you consider his language as representative of the Armenian that was spoken? Yeah, sure. Um, he had a good secondary education in Armenian and French. Uh, the road to social advancement for people of his class, which was like upper working class, lower middle class, was through the priesthood. Uh, he was himself a choir boy at Surkarabe Church in um, Skutari, which is still there. Uh, and he knew the Sharagans by heart. On his deathbed, he sang them. Uh, his first poems were written not in Ashkarapar, but in Karapar, in classical Armenian. Uh, and he was quite proficient in that language. And his, some, of his, some of his dramas are heavily Karapar. Um, he 
toyed with being a priest. He wanted to be one, but ultimately the theater had a stronger pull. Had he lived, he would probably have become a playwright and stayed a playwright, principally a playwright and a, 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 a journalist and poet. He was a widely published journalist by his 20th birthday. Um, he applied to Bishop Corin Narve, I think, for financial aid at one point and was refused. He was very embittered at the church hierarchy for their failure to give him more financial aid than he thought he deserved. Less financial aid than he thought he deserved. Um, but nonetheless, he always had in the back of his mind becoming a priest. That, and uh, so that was, that was a root of advancement. As far as his own language goes, it's very different, actually, in many respects, from the spoken Armenian of Constantinople. It's not Bolis dialect. It is instead a, 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 a thoroughly literary, limpid, new language which he really invented himself. There are a few archaisms in it. He has uses, for example, and this is kind of artificial, the word net, meaning sheep, which had been created in the 5th century as an alternative to the all-purpose na, uh, which on, that is, meaning yeah. he, she, or it. He, he has a poem called net. Uh, and another one called Uznebashdeh, meaning I worship her. Yeah? Uh, this is the accusative case in classical Armenian za, with ne, her, and then bashdem, notice, without the ga. So it's pure classical. But then the poem itself is in classical. It is in Ashkarabar, his own Ashkarabar. So he was a linguistic innovator. And he was followed, very consciously, by the next generation of poets. Um, what happened was, though, that between his the, between the time of his death, he died in 18, February 1872, and the next big wave of Armenian poets around the turn of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire prohibited any kind of secular, patriotic publication amongst Armenians. Uh, under Abdul Hamid, as you know, yes, it was prohibited to mention the word star, ast, because you, in, in any Armenian publication, because they thought it was an encoded reference to Yulduz, Turkish star, which would thus mean Yulduz palace. You see? You could not say the word Hayastan or Hayrenik. This was one of the reasons why, although people followed Turian's lead in their linguistic style, they changed a great deal else. And he wrote very openly about politics and about patriotic concerns. This was impossible to do in, say, 1895-96. So that when Misak Nezarens came to the capital from the provinces, he didn't even dare to write about being Armenian or anything else. He wrote elegies, and he used symbolist language. Anyone who wanted to write anything about the present situation had to use symbolist language in any case. So there was a kind of a break. After the Young Turk Revolution, uh, Armenian literature, for a very short period, really flooded back into the channel that Turian had created. Uh, and I guess Sian Manto is the, is the most obvious example. This kind of style, this sort of writing. Yeah, and then he died. Sian Manto was murdered. After that, well, after that, you know better than I am what the state is of Armenian literature in Constantinople, but there is one great writer, Zahrad, yes, Zahrad, whose poetry reminds me more than anything else of Nazan Hikmet. No? So Armenian had potentials that could have been developed, but the world that sustained such a culture was destroyed. Is that more or less? Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Nimeva <coughs> says that Podashevich had no single blood, uh, blood, I mean, a drop of Russian blood. And he seems to have been a Pole. Pole? Pole. Yeah. Wasn't he? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. He was a Pole. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great Pole. Pole. 
Is he published now in, uh, in Russia? And not only is he published now in Russia, but one of my own colleagues, John Malmstad, in the Slavic department, wrote the introduction to his work for the uh, series Novi Biblioteca Poeta. It's the only foreigner who has written an introduction to any of the great poets in that series. Yeah. Uh, he has no direct connection to Armenia. However, Khlyabnikov does. Khlyabnikov seems to have been Armenian. At least he claims to have been. Vyanimir Khlyabnikov. He was Armenian. Pardon? He was Armenian. He was Armenian. Yeah. He says he was. Yes, he came from southern Russia. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, this is a whole separate thing. I'm, I actually, I'm working on, not in a, well, I'm working on another book or two, but I'm also working on an article right now, which is, it might interest you to know about this. Since we were talking about what came after, one of the things that came after uh, Turia was an enormous flourishing of Russian liter of Armenian literature in Russia, in the Transcaucasus, and also in the capitals, in Moscow and Petersburg. One of the great poets of this period, the turn of the century, was Vahan Teryan. Probably you know him. Yeah, Vahan Teryan, uh, who was an inspiration to my favorite poet, Charens. Uh, Vahan Teryan uh, was translated into Russian by Vyacheslav Ivanov. Uh, Ivanov was the dean of the Symbolist School of Poetry in St. Petersburg, and his apartment, which is called the Tower, was the meeting place for all of the poets of the day, and anyone who wanted to be respected went there. So Khlyabnikov, for example, appeared at Ivanov's house once very, very hesitantly. <coughs> yeah. uh, and another person was Valery Rusev. So Rusev published a very important volume in 1916 called Atologia Poesi, the Anthology of Armenian Poetry. It's been reprinted innumerable times, and it's still in print, it's not hard to find, uh, where Ivanov translated the Hanterian. There are translations of Turian too, and I've mentioned them in this book. But Terian answered Ivanov. He wrote back to him. Because Ivanov wrote some rather precious verses about Armenia being roses and things like that. And Terion was irritated. He said, at a time like this, how can you allow yourself to write about Armenia as just being sunlight and roses? You know, with what was going on? So there was a kind of a dialogue between Armenian and Russian poets, the period exemplified by Terion and his very different consciousness of what was happening in Armenia, which was somewhat less antiquarian than that of the symbolists. Um, but it was important because it opened a dialogue which continued, and then, you, then it assumes enormous proportions with Mandelstam's trip to Armenia and his poems. I'm writing about that right now. It's very interesting. Who knows, maybe in a year, I'll come and talk to talk about it here. Um, yeah. a a a any other questions, comments? If not, Mark. Six four nine five zero seven five. Six four nine five zero seven five. And six four nine five zero nine five. Nine five and seven five. And seven five. Seven seven. <laughs> Good try. Enough. Whoever you get to get something <laughs> before we get to There's cake. There is. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, and if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book from the bookstore, you can find Professor Russell and he'll sign it. And thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Right. Yes. I'd like to make a comment. You may make a comment. I, I don't know much of Turan's poetry, but I remember the saying that. If somebody didn't attend to his grave, he would be forgotten. And I think what Professor Russell has done has tended his grave. Thank you. Thank you.